All right, welcome to this week's episode of the JJ Reddick podcast. Uh, we have uh, Milwaukee Bucks shooting guard Pat Connaughton joining Tommy and I. Pat, thanks for coming on the show, man. Appreciate you guys having me. Excited to be on. Where, where are you right now? Have you been in Milwaukee the whole time? Are you in your, your home market? Yep, I'm in Milwaukee. Um, I didn't leave. I stayed here the whole time. Um, you know, the Bucks did a great job of supporting us, obviously, medically. If anything happened, you know, they had the staff here and, and doctors on call. But it was also one of those things where they did a good job supplying weights, bikes, and, uh, you know, some food from the chefs once a week, things like that to try to incentivize guys to stick around and, and quite frankly, to help guys out, um, you know, who did stick around. What, uh, what percentage of guys on your team, I'm just curious, uh, stuck around Milwaukee and, 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 and didn't leave. I would say probably like 90%. I would say some of the, the older veterans that, uh, you know, have houses and families elsewhere, um, did some quarantining in the, in those places. But for the most part, uh, you know, we kind of have a young team. So we have, uh, the majority of guys sticking around in market and, and, and trying to find things to keep them busy here in the great city of Milwaukee. <laughs> how, how long, how long did you go right when everything shut down in March? How long did you go before? Like you picked up a basketball? Oh, uh, you know, it was, it was basically the, the entire quarantine. I would say it was six, eight weeks. Um, that was like the biggest question I got through any like fa friends, family, and any interviews that I had to do for the team. Like, have you ever gone this long without touching a basketball? You know, I found ways to stay in shape, run Hills outside, um, you know, do push ups, sit ups. I got a few bikes, Peloton, things like that, but the not touching a basketball, you know, I was, I have a basketball in my apartment. I was kind of dribbling around my apartment. You know, my best friend and his fiance who's in the real estate stuff I do, uh, live with me. So I was dribbling around them, but they're not, you know, JJ caliber defenders. So I had to, uh, really, uh, you know, put a few chairs in there as well. Very few people are, uh, are as good of defenders as me. I know my defensive RPM, I think is fifth worst amongst shooting guards. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I say that's, I, I always say I hate it. analytics. I hate analytics for sure. That's I thought it. it was fifth best. That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> so NBA, uh, we actually haven't recorded a podcast yet, uh, since the NBA, I guess officially is back. Obviously we're still working out, uh, some things, uh, with the league and the union, uh, in terms of specific logistics of how this is all going to work. Uh, but just give me give me your thoughts on the return of the NBA and, you know, specifically with regards to adding in the regular season. And, and do you feel like uh, you guys needed that or, or would you have been OK going straight to the playoffs? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think I have a unique opinion a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm pretty into like business in general and, and the way the NBA business works kind of fascinates me. Um so when I try to take my biasy out of it, when I look at it, I thought it was important that, you know, we came back to some degree. Uh, and I'm saying that obviously with the understanding that health precautions and safety and all that is the number one priority. But, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't think it, it made sense to just cancel the season with the unknown of what could happen next year. And, you know, the things that we're hearing where there may not be fans next year until January one and with fans making up, you know, concessions gate, all that making up like 40% of the revenue. Did it make sense to, why would you cancel this season when you could potentially get something out of it, uh, crown a champion and at least give some hope. I mean, I think sports in general gives some hope to the rest of the world, rest of the country, et cetera. So, uh, I kind of liked that they stayed in limbo a little bit and it was a little unknown. I didn't personally like it because I would have liked to have some certainty on our end as players. But, uh, from a business standpoint, I thought it kind of made sense. And then I thought it would be kind of unique. I think it'll be a unique time to try to mess with some stuff. You know what I mean? A different NBA season. Uh, you know, I know there's been some owners that have been pushing for that because of a certain theory that, you know, the beginning of our season competes with football. And if the beginning of our season didn't, it would be bring about better revenue and the middle of our season would have nothing else on television. Then the end of the season would, you know, just be competing with baseball, which uh, I think owners are happy about if they can. So I think trying the play in format, you know, doing some regular season games and then doing maybe a play in for the last, I know baseball adopts that for the wild card. Uh, so personally I've seen it work really well. And, uh, you know, I think just playing around with those different, um, situations will be kind of cool to see how it works out from a business standpoint for the NBA and, you know, trying to find ways to with the TV deal holds us up right now. Right. So 
if everything's going to streaming, is there ways to auto populate the NBA app during this time and get some behind the scenes stuff within the bubble um, that fans will pay for and want to see uh, that can only be seen on the NBA app. And then as the years go on, that app becomes where people watch games. That's very interesting. It's a great point. Uh, The one thing you just mentioned about waiting and the uncertainty, I think for me and for a lot of guys, that was probably the hardest part. And I know people across the country who are either out of work or have been furloughed or um, who's who can't return to their office to do their job. I, I think that I think resonates with everyone. And when you're sitting around and you're getting information every week or every two weeks about what a potential return to play looks like, um, it can be a little frustrating at times with all the information and misinformation that comes along. I think for me, it was just it was just good to know that we have a plan and this is what's going to happen and it's definitive. And I can actually look out and and say, all right, well, you know, for most of July and, and August, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida, in in sweltering heat, um, <laughs> in a in a bubble. So let me ask you something. We're, this it came out yesterday that um, we can't we can't leave the bubble, and I kind yeah. of assumed that, but they were very Shams was very specific. It's a, it's a ten day quarantine plus two negative coronavirus tests. Do you think there's any NBA players that will attempt to leave the bubble? I do. I mean, look, I, I, I'm with I, like like I said, kind of at the beginning. Like I think health and safety is the one priority. I would love if guys wouldn't just for sanctity of the league and getting it done. And it's, you know, look, it's not every team is going to be there for eight to 12 weeks. You know, there'll be teams that are out after the regular season. There'll be teams that are out after the first round, like the numbers will keep coming down. So I would like to think that guys have the self-control to, to stay in one place and just kind of treat it like a, like a fraternity, you know, hanging around with your other brothers and, and, and being in, uh, you know, the bubble and playing basketball and things like that. But um, I think with the way the rest of the world seems to be going, things opening up and people maybe not smartly uh, going out and, and, and uh, being at beaches and things of that nature from what I've seen on television. Um, I think it's going to be tough to convince NBA guys that we have to be in that bubble when no one else really is. So um, my hope is if, and when guys do leave the bubble um, or like a, they're safe and they have those negative tests and that doesn't become a problem, but B maybe there's a way for the NBA to, you know, open up Disney world, a certain part of the rides for us, you know, specifically, if they want us in that bubble, maybe we can start to like have the bubble move as a unit to, to do different things. But I do think that will be a challenge unless they're going to have security guards at every single uh, gate. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty difficult to keep everybody in that bubble for 12 potential weeks. Have they said what the punishment is going to be if if you get caught leaving? You get cool. quarantined for 10 days. You can't play. So you just can't play. So you it's, it's, straight, can't, it's what if, straight up. What if they, what if it's they took the, the, it's what, basically like you showing symptoms and getting a positive test. You can't return to play until you have a 10-day quarantine and two uh, negative tests. I would assume one at the beginning of that quarantine and one at the end of the quarantine. I wonder what if they did like the, you remember the rookie transition program? If you left, you had to come back and do it again and you got fined like 30 grand. So next summer you have to come back and be quarantined and dizzy again. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of guys wouldn't leave then. (laughs) A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I mean, the problem you guys are going to have, and and honestly, like it's, it, it, MB with, with camera phones, how are you going to leave and get away with it? Yeah. You know, it's like, I, it's really tough. Yeah, it's it's tough in general because you're you're also talking about like let's just be honest. You're not just talking about people leaving. You're talking about people bringing people in too. Like the bubble, you, you can't leave the bubble. And you're not supposed to have to also have people into the bubble. So that I think is it's a two way street, and that's going to be the most difficult part of of making sure you keep guys contained. Uh, but hopefully, as I said, as the rounds start dwindling and as the regular season gets over and as teams leave. Uh, you know, guys will start to take it seriously and, and understand like, where are you really going? You know, where are you really going in Disney world? What are you, what, why are you leaving? Where, if you can't go on the rides or you're not going to at least get away with going to, you know, MGM studios and getting on the rock and roll roller coaster without somebody yeah. taking a picture of you, then what are you really going to do? It's like what in Orlando is a can't miss thing that you have to leave the bubble to go <laughs> yeah. see alligator farm. Like, <laughs> who knows? 
Uh, all right, here's a scenario I'm going to lay out that I think I think is a is a very high probability of happening. Um, let's say, so there's six teams that aren't current, currently in the playoffs, and from my understanding, to be eligible for the play-in tournament, you have to be four games or less behind the eighth seed. Yep. So what happens if some of these teams come back and uh, three, four games go by and they're essentially mathematically eliminated from being, you know, from being able to get to that four game barrier. And there's still four or five games left to play for their team. There's going to be some guys that say, fuck this and leave. <laughs> it's, it's inevitable. That's true. That I've been true. in Disney world now for five weeks. I'm good. My team's not going to make the play in game. I'm out. Yep. That's going to yeah, happen. That's, or, yeah, that's, or maybe it looks like I have a sprained ankle. I'm going to go home. Yeah. That's a great point. Uh, and I don't know how you combat that. I mean, unless, and I don't, I don't know. I, unless like when a guy leaves, he just leaves for good. So he's literally purposely breaching the bubble. No, that's so that what I'm saying. He's going home. He's yeah. That's what I'm saying. He's going home. I like, I'm not going to name a name, but like a guy on, let's say like the wizards is just like, fuck it. We're out. I'm yeah. gone. I'm going home. Do you now, do you think they should nix the four game? Do you think it just should be based off seating? Like if you're like in baseball, there's no mathematical games behind. It's just the wild card and the person, the team right behind the wild card they play. Right. Um, I, I mean, I think, it gives specifically with the Western conference, it gives all these teams that are sort of bunched up a fair shot to, mm -hmm. to get the eighth seed. Um, you know, I think we talked about this, you know, before, but you know, it's, I think they did the play in game because Zion is not in the playoffs. That's why they brought these teams <laughs> back. There's probably some other financial reasons, reasons in regards to regional sports network contracts, but yeah, I mean, for, for the attention in the NBA, like, I wonder if the, if it was reversed and Z and by the way, Ja Morant is a is a highlight reel and an attraction in his own right. But if Zion was in the eighth seed and the Pelicans, we were in the eighth seed. I'm wondering if we're doing this. Is that's that is question. that is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think I think in my opinion. Now you've seen it this whole year, so you have probably a better vision of it than me. I think it's fifty 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 percent Zion fifty percent. Those oh, teams yeah. like Portland yeah. and everybody else who would have been up in arms about not sure. getting an opportunity to make the playoffs, I think. And like you said, right, regional TV, all that stuff is obvious. But like, I think Adam is taking the time to test a few ideas. Uh, maybe the playing tournament sticks around. You know, there were yeah. some things thrown around at the beginning of this year where there was an in season tournament, which had nothing to do with playing in the playoffs, but like different ideas to combat the TV revenue and things of that nature. And I think this is the time to kind of, you know, beta test it. I, I should also mention, look, D Damian Lillard, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal. I mean, there's a bunch yeah. of other guys that are attractions and, and highlight real players and, and star players in their own right. I don't want to take anything away from those guys. Um, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the logistics of this and, and what our day-to-day -day lives are going to look yeah, like. I have, I have many questions about yeah, this. Yeah, so Let's I have some this. questions. <laughs> I have some things to talk about. First of all, my first question, as it relates to you and your team, yep. have you guys heard anything about uh, what sort of benefits you guys are going to get from being a higher seed once the playoff starts? Like, what is what is home court advantage going to look like if you're the number so, one seed in the East? I, I haven't. And it's funny. You, you mentioned that I was chatting with some guys on the team and, and actually a few of the owners, uh, during our, our March on Sunday, and they've heard a lot about, Hey, there might be an asterisk next to this win because it's no fans or whatever. And they're coming back on the other side saying, yeah, it's going to be that much harder because the one seed, which was us at the time, has no home court advantage. There is no home court advantage, no fans, no anything. So they seemed to be putting some pressure on trying to find a solution to that. The only idea that I ever heard was pumping in crowd noise at certain times, but I don't know how much of an effect that would actually happen. So I actually think there won't be uh, any advantage to, to the seating. I actually think it's going to be um, 
just tough luck, unfortunately. Maybe uh, maybe teams on higher seeds get sweets at the Grand Floridian, so, uh, this is, and, this every, is, and this everybody is one of my else questions. gets a regular room. This is one yeah. of my questions. Have they the lodging? Are you guys all so it's just team hotels? Is everyone in a different hotel? I think uh, everyone, from what I've heard, I think everyone's in the same hotel. There's three. Okay, so I wrote this down on my call uh, with Griff the other day, and I'm trying to find it. Hold on. Oh yeah, here we go. So it's um, the three hotels are the Yacht Club, the Grand Floridian, and the Grand. Vestino. Those are the three hotels. And are these hotels all like equal in quality or is one of them? I don't know. I think we should get on know. Yelp. I think we should get on Yelp and test yeah. this out. <laughs> that would be a wild, that would be wild. Like sweets for the number one seeds. Every yeah. number eight and nine seeds actually have roommates. Yeah. They don't even have yes. their own room. Yes. That's like, a good one. Maybe the quality of one. food. Like some guys get steak and grilled chicken. Other guys get wings and pizza. And if you sweep, and if you sweep the first round, the food gets better. <laughs> yeah, start, yeah. They start rotating at the Pentagon. <laughs> everything's incentivized. <laughs> That'll be no. That's a great. That's a great point. I don't. I personally, I don't think there will be any advantage to being the one seed anymore. Unfortunately, uh, but that that would be that would be an interesting interesting idea. Did you, did you play? Um, did you play AU when you were growing up? Basketball. I did. I didn't play AU basketball till really until my sophomore and junior year of high school because I played baseball every summer. Because a couple players uh, we've talked to have sort of compared it to that in terms of an energy of just like, there's no other situation. Even the Olympics isn't really like this. Like There's no other situation where you're walking around and you're just seeing guys all the time, like getting food and doing whatever in a way where like, like you guys don't really interact with each other that much during the regular season. Kind of like play yeah, and Besides guys that you know and you're friends with, you might grab dinner the night before a game, but you're, you're absolutely right. Like AAU would probably be the best. Like we went down to Orlando to play AAU, but at the milk house to Jocelyn center. Um, and you're around the hotel. You see other teams uh, that are around the hotel at the pool, uh, you know, walking around the shopping centers, malls, whatever. Obviously I don't think any of that will be happening. Um, you know, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. Like, is there a way to, like put guys like can guys go to games like can i if i'm not playing on one day can i go to a game can i sit courtside like that would be kind of cool for fans to see if you got russ courtside at the oklahoma city thunder playoff game like it would just i think there would be some unique situations that fans and quite frankly myself would love to to see kind of what happens and how guys react and 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 all that sort of thing if you've got players sitting courtside as opposed to fans owners whatever i mean i would assume like once we're in the bubble and we get past that like two three week mark like if you're not if you're testing negatively and you're not having symptoms that we can all interact with each other right i i i i yeah. I, I was told that if like we have a friend on another team like we can go hang out with that friend we don't have to yeah. like socially distance from other t- you know people once everybody's in the bubble and we're all squared away and and it's good to go like we're good but can you go to like games? That's a great like, question. Cause I can't take I an Uber to idea. a game, right? Like I can't, <laughs> I can't just get in a random Uber. That's not part of the bubble. Like they have yeah. fans shuttles that are going back yeah. and forth. Like, cause I think going to games would be, would be cool. Like, I think it would be unique. Like you saw the league in China, the baseball league that was throwing stuffed animals and behind the uh, plate. Right. Yeah. That yeah. was looking like it was, that was, awesome. like a, that was cool. Yeah. But like, imagine yeah. if that was just like us, like they're like, you're hearing guys speak. I mean, everything's going to be loud. Like you're going to hear guys talk trash back and forth. Like I think it would, it would be, no, you don't want any fights breaking out, but I think it would yeah. be pretty, pretty cool. And it, it's cool. It would be cool if it's like, like the team you, you're, you say you guys sweep your first round series and you go to see the teams that you might play in the next round and you go and like you go as a team and you go and you just scout it out and everything like that. Like there's an element to it, which this, the whole thing with all of this stuff is it's never going to happen again. So For every, sure. So it's every, it's history. Any, yeah. So everything like this, the more you can push the issue without getting like suspended or, or, or quarantined or whatever, like the For better. Sure. Like, like what if we are I don't, like, this is completely hypothetical, but what if we were going to play the Raptors or the Celtics in the Eastern conference finals and 
we wanted to play one team as close to the other. And you had Giannis standing behind the backboard like this during a free throw <laughs> to win the game, trying to like distract the guy. Like that's good television. People yeah. are watching that. You know what I mean? Like that's fun. Like, and that's a side that like people don't get to see. No one sees us as fans. People only see us as players. Yeah. That's great. I like that. Uh, do you have a, do you have a specific uh, game day routine? And if so, cause I do. And, and it's, it's long. I mean, it's it, like game days are like eight hour days, you know, and yeah. it, they're, they're, I mean, of like real stuff, like pre- preparatory work and late and, and working out and all this stuff to get ready just to play. And I, that's, that's a, especially as an older guy, that's sort of my <clears throat> concern, like logistically on a game day is like, am I going to have just, a, I know it's not gonna be normal, but just the, the right amount of resources and space and access to gym equipment that I need to, to prepare to play. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. But that's actually, I asked an assistant coach about that the other day. Um, I do have a routine. Um, I'm actually being a old baseball player. I've actually gone the out, like baseball players are superstitious, like no other. Right. Um, so if they're supposed to eat at a certain time and they eat the same meal at three Oh seven every day before a game, like if it's three Oh nine, they're thrown off for that day. So I've actually gone the other way. I have like certain parts of my routine that I try to do each and every game day, but I try to allow for some like differences because I don't mentally, I feel like it's a little bit easier and a little bit more healthy for me to be able to have some flexibility. Every day is different. It's not going to be the same. I can only control so many things. So like, as far as when I eat a pregame meal, I try to do that hour and a half, two hours before a game. Um, I always do a lift before the game. Uh, I always try to do some sprints on the bike, like right before tip. Um, you know, I always try to get a sweat, some shots up, dribbling drills, different things, um, during our selected shooting time out on the court before the game, um, stretch things like that. But I don't have like a, a regimented the entire time. I try not to sleep in. I try to wake up early, do something in the morning and then take a nap in the afternoon before the game, things like that. Uh, but from what I heard, I don't even like might be the assistant coaches being ball boys. Like I I haven't even heard there's going to be any (laughs) ball boys. Like, I don't know if it's going to be frigging layup lines. Like, cause you also got to think how many games they're trying to get done on a daily basis. If they're starting that, I mean, I don't know about you. I hate noon games. Like it screws up the whole routine. You know what I mean? It brings me back to college. So, um, it'll be interesting to see what they allow. Like, are you just rolling out layup lines 30 minutes before the game and like figure it out? Like, like, what do you think is going to, you probably know more than I do. Well, I think, I think, uh, one thing mentally that I'm preparing for, because at times I can be a little rigid, especially when it comes to sort of, you know, my routine. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I've yelled at people pregame before. (laughs) If they fucked with my shit, I have, I have, yeah, I yelled, I yelled at Jamel McMillan, like our first regular season game this year. Cause he yeah. told me my wrong shooting time. I, like, Jamel, I don't shoot at that time. I shoot at 45 on the clock. <laughs> I just, so I, lie. I, I get a little, a little more. Of that. <laughs> yeah. I get a little worked up about things. It's, I'm just very specific, but like mentally I'm already, already preparing. Like I've, you've got to let go and relax. Like this is, as you guys just mentioned, this is sort of unprecedented. This will never happen again. And I think most people will understand like this isn't your normal preparation, you know, normal practice, whatever. It's not going to be, it's not going to be what it's like. And so I just kind of have to just mentally prepare and let go. I read something, uh, I think it was yesterday about, I can't remember what owner it was. Uh, talking about how they were looking into uh, like buying um, nicer TVs and outfitting rooms with like stereo equipment and video games for guys, like trying to figure out if that would like be okay with the CBA. But like, no, but I mean, we're like going back to just living in this bubble for anywhere from like six to 12 weeks, you know, there, there it's, it's going to get a little monotonous and it's going to get it's going to get, I think, mentally a little challenging. And and so trying to figure out what those like creature comforts are for guys, I think is, I think it's going to be huge. Well, let me ask you, how are you going to pack for it? Like I, when have you ever had to pack for a road trip longer than 10 days? Like in done laundry on the road, like yeah. just like simple stuff, like daily life things, like food, like we eat at those same, are we going to have to eat at the same restaurants within the thing 
every single day for eight to 12 weeks or will chefs like, will per, like the team chefs be able to come down and cook different stuff? Like, can you have yoga and spin classes or something for guys on off days? Like I know you'll have team lifts and stuff like that, but like there's a lot of hours in a day. If you're yeah. in one place for seven to eight to 12 weeks at one time. Well, one of the things is there's 35 people that can come, 15 players. The league has sort of mandated, I think, 10 of around 10 of those extra 20 positions. You know, there's got to be two equipment guys, there's got to be uh, a PR guy, a social media manager. Like, there's all these yeah. things. So then the teams are now left with, like, all right, well, which trainers do we bring? Do we bring a massage therapist? Do we bring to massage, like everybody's sort of scrambling to figure this out. And I'm sure as these conversations go deeper, you know, over the next week or so, I'm sure we'll have more information about this, but it is, it is, you're right. You, you brought up like the assistant coaches and head coaches, like Alvin Gentry might have to <laughs> rebound for me pregame. That's not an exaggeration. I know, he might like have to coach, be out there on the court. Like coach bud, if like coach buds out on the floor, yeah. like, like, what happens if I miss a few pregame shots? Is that going to affect my playing time? Is he going to be like, Oh, he's not ready to play or he, he, today's not his day. Like how, how is that going to, how is that going to fly? A good question. And then, what about, what about two way guys? Are they part of the 35? Like they're out. They're definitely they're out. out. They're, they're definitely, definitely out. out. They, I think they might be able to replace a player if he gets injured, but the two way yeah. guys are out. They're not part of the 35. Originally they were, they're not out. They're out though. Okay. So if a guy gets injured, they get brought in. I guess they yeah. get quarantined for two weeks. Like <laughs> what have they been doing for the last month? Yeah. Like, yeah. There's a quarantine. There's, there's so many logistics. You're right. That go into it. And like, yeah. who's singing the national anthem, by the way. Great question. I'll, I mean, will there I'm even be, be a be national made. anthem? <laughs> yeah. It's going to do it eight times a day. It's like, going to be, yeah. it's going to be Vic. It's going to be old Epo or someone who can sit a player <laughs> oh. that can sing. That would be Vic's dope, gonna get actually. kept there. Vic's gonna get kept <laughs> every, there every game. <laughs> if Indiana gets bounced, he's gonna be kept there for the remainder of the uh, seven, eight weeks. What's, what, what's the breakdown with families versus like girlfriends? Like, do you have to be married? That's a good question. I, I am so uh, uh, well. I guess I'm clear now, but from what we were originally told to what is coming out now about families not being able to come until after the first round of the playoffs. That's not what we were originally told. And so I'm like, you know, I have a wife and two kids. So I'm like, I'm like locked in, not going to see them. You know, I'm going back to new Orleans in the next, you know, few days or whatever I'm locked in. I'm not going to see them for two months. And that's, I mean, as a dad, as somebody who actually likes being around their family, that's, that's tough, man. That's tough. Yeah. Probably not really easy for your wife either. I'm going to deal with the two kids without your help for right. two months. Right. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it complicates things for sure. It complicates things. Um, when this all, when this all like got announced though, I, I feel like the reaction, uh, on like Twitter and social media, I feel like it wasn't what I expected it to be. And, and obviously a lot of that had to do with, um, you know, the protests going on around the country, um, in regards to, to Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Am Ahmaud Arbery. And in some ways, and I want to get your thoughts on this, Pat, but in some ways, like my excitement to return isn't even personally, it isn't what I thought it was going to be because there's so much other stuff going on right now. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, based off discussing, talking with teammates and, and, and my own like opinions on it, like there are more important things than, than basketball at the moment in time within our country. Um, but I also think basketball and sports bring about hope. It brings unity. It has diversity within it, things of that nature. And I think, you know, one of the, the, the conversations that I had about it was uh, with, with some teammates was it'll be nice to be in a place with your teammates again, fighting towards one common goal, um, no matter what race, ethnicity, diversity, skin color you are. Um, and with the hope that that will translate as a professional athlete, sometimes in, in, in my personal life, I can be naive to how it is because we're in this bubble 
ironically using the word bubble again, we're in this bubble where everything is equal in my opinion, for the most part, there obviously are some things that still have to be at the higher levels that have to be, um, stressed, but, um, as teammates, you know, we, we all love being around each other. It doesn't really matter. And so my hope is with sports coming back, that can at least bring some hope so that the rest of the world can kind of take after some of the things that we do within the NBA because sure. of how great Adam's been about being, allowing guys to use it as a platform to speak out on social issues like this. Yeah, no, I, I, I think a couple of things to what you just said, first of all, uh, in regards to just being back with your teammates, I think what a lot of people felt during the, the first few months of this pandemic is loneliness. Right. And if you're on a sports team, you're used to being around, be, you're used to be being around, you know, dozens and dozens, dozens of people that are your friends. And then of course, on a game day, you're around tens of thousands of people. You interact right. with hundreds of people every day. And to have that stop so suddenly uh, is really hard. That was something that I really struggled with early on, was just just like not being around teammates, not being around my coaches, not having those interactions in the locker room, in the training room, in practice or whatever. Um, second thing I wanted to say to what you, you said, you know, when I was growing up, there wasn't, I don't remember ever hearing the word white privilege. I, I don't remember that wasn't taught to me. That wasn't like a common term at the time. I don't know, Tommy, could you can you speak to that at all? I don't I had, remember I had, that. I had heard it, but it's certainly not the same, you know. Yeah, yeah. Level but intuitively, intuitively you see that, right? Yeah. Intuitively growing up, you see, oh, black people are treated differently in this country. And then and then the last like five years, obviously, that phrase and that notion has become mainstream and now everybody you know talks about that or whatever and you know one of the things I, I said this you know on our our teammate call last week but like I was aware of it I knew it was there I felt like I always was an advocate it was hard for me to sort of apply white privilege to my own life because I was like oh well I my parents I didn't grow up rich my I went to public school I never had money. My parents were always in debt. You know, I made the league. I worked hard or whatever. It was hard for me at first to like really apply it to my own life. In the last two, three years, like, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of reflected and realized how privileged I've been <laughs> to be white in this country. For sure. I can give you specific, specific examples, but for sure it's there. Um, but it is just to just to go back. It is um, exciting for me because of the pandemic and then now everything our country's going through, it's exciting for me to sort of get back in a, what it was like a happy place, which is, you know, with, with our teammates. Well, I would, I would add, I was going to say, I would add one, one quick thing to that with both to, with both of you said, you know, in terms of the loneliness thing, I think that that's a thing for fans as well. You know, fans of all backgrounds and everything like that love watching you guys play and they love talking about it online. They love going to the games. And so, even before everything of the last couple of weeks, just starting in March, you know, having this be a thing that uh, was taken away from them for the right reasons, but still a thing that was taken away from them. There is a uniting factor that I hope that we're going to see come back uh, in July. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, sports, it's, it's a common denominator in a lot of American lives, uh, you know, watching them rooting for certain teams, like, uh, pulling for players, being able to fans and young kids, being able to look up to players, interact with them, um, you know, not just on social media, but at games, sidelines, whatever. Uh, so, uh, although obviously there's, you know, a level as to how that can be done when sports are back, there won't be fans at games and things like that. I think just being able to get back to watching sports, I, I agree, hopefully will unify. And, and, and I also think, you know, the NBA, and guys on certain teams, I think they'll do a great job, you know, as sports are coming back to, to use it as a spotlight to, to really try to inflict some, some social change that's been needed. Um, and that's been brought to the forefront in the last, you know, few weeks. By the way, Tommy, uh, you tweet, you texted me a tweet this morning from a, um, prominent conservative, um, 
uh, talking head who said something uh, along, uh, ben, ben Shapiro, Ben, ben Shapiro, Shapiro, who said something along, I didn't want to say his name, but you said it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to try to not say his name, but so he was with, uh, he was doing an interview with Clay Travis, who, who's an absolute just idiot. Yeah. I was going to say shithead. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so those guys are like Ben Shapiro is talking about how, um, you know, he, he canceled his sports illustrated, uh, su uh, subscription because, uh, Caitlyn Jenner was on the cover and how he, he, he hopes that someday there's a sec there's a, a whole s subdivision now, a second sports leagues where politics are just completely taken out of it. And that he his basically his happy place has been taken away. It's been removed from his life. He can't, he doesn't know if he'll ever be able to watch sports anymore because now sports and politics are so intertwined, which is fucking insane. Wow. Yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna send you we're gonna send you the clip when we get off. It's a it is uh it, it was insane at any point, but in this moment in particular, it's insane because you're he's missing so many points. But I think one of the major ones he's missing, Pat, is something you just talked about. Is like think about the conversations you have with your teammates. Like this is a thing that is it coalesces throughout the sport, it coalesces throughout the locker room. So to just put your head under the pillow and act like this thing doesn't exist. Is not only like disrespectful like to society and to your neighbors, but it's disrespectful to the players that you cheer for. This is a thing that affects you guys directly, for sure. And I, I mean, I would say this is far more important than what I'm going to compare it to. But like, you know, it's kind of like back in the beginning when guys started, athletes started to get involved in business. No one liked athletes getting involved in business. I mean, you got the famous quote of our so LeBron: "Shut up and dribble." But like no one enjoyed athletes getting involved in business. Now people don't enjoy athletes getting involved in politics and, you know, they're both for the right reasons. You know what I mean? I think people are very narrow minded, uh, in nature sometimes, um, because of everything about athletes being public athletes income, what they do, like, and, and I don't think they like, the idea of athletes being able to have their own opinions and their own thoughts and their own business and their own, you know, political views. And, uh, you know, I'm happy at least being an NBA guy that the NBA has supported guys on both the business and the political views front for social change, social justice, things of that nature. Because at the end of the day, one like Darvin Ham, one of our assistant coaches made a great point. Like we're all human before we are basketball players. We're all human before we are athletes. And, it kind of starts right there. Like from what we've seen over the last few weeks, like these are people not being treated as, as human, you know, obviously it's, it's a race thing, black, white, like white people aren't treating black people. And that's a history thing, but it starts just human beings treating human beings. It's as other human beings. It, it is, uh, it's dehumanizing. You're right. It's dehumanizing for anyone to tell an athlete to shut up and dribble. You're not allowed to have a political view. You're not allowed to pursue business opportunities. That is incredibly dehumanizing. When you add in the factor of race, that a lot of people saying these things are white, and a lot of the athletes doing these things are black, it is 100% a reflection of the racism in our country. And 100%. you, it's impossible for me. And I, I, I have private conversations with people that I don't know that well, that will say something about my teammates or NBA players or whatever. And I'm like, well, hold the fuck on. No, 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 no. Let me correct you real quick. You're talking about, uh, husbands, dads, businessmen, uh, activists, uh, uh, college graduates. I mean, you're talking about some of the smartest, most intelligent, most, most driven people to dehumanize them in any way is completely fucked. And I'm not going to stand for it. it. Honestly, it's like, it's, it's insecurity in my opinion. Yeah. Like it's just, it's, it's being nervous that somebody else is stepping into your zone and having a view or a business yeah. that is better than yours in, in my opinion and, and has a platform to actually do something about it. Yeah, I would totally I would, agree with that. I want to talk to you about some of the stuff you're doing off the court uh, and ask you about that. 
So you mentioned earlier um, you have a real estate business. Just tell us about how you got involved in that and and what kind of things you're doing. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I was fortunate. I grew up around my dad, who was a general contractor. So uh, kind of like you mentioned, JJ, like always working on job sites. You know, uh, busting his hump to 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 try to make a living for for me and my family. And I ended up at a young age, junior high, obviously into high school, working on his job sites, hauling lumber up and down the stairs cleaning up the yard, throwing stuff in the dumpsters, all that sort of stuff. But uh, it taught me hard work. And, and what it also showed me was just, which I didn't understand at the time, was just you know, a house that nobody wants being turned into a house that somebody will pay money for and want. And as I got older, like I've always been an advocate for athletes and business and kind of trying to disprove that stereotype that ESPN 30 for 30 broke kind of came out, that athletes ended up broke. Like, I don't know why, maybe it was going to Notre Dame, going to the undergrad business school, whatever. But like, I've always been fascinated with trying to really make sure that that stereotype changes. So for me, when I graduated from Notre Dame, or actually even ahead of time, when I got drafted for baseball after my junior year of high school, my dad had flipped the house at Notre Dame, gave him an excuse to come to the basketball games. Um, I approached him and asked if I could do the same thing. I was, uh, I was fortunate enough. I was able to accept the signing bonus from baseball in between my junior and senior summer, I played pro baseball that summer. And, you know, we kind of flipped the house. I lived in it my senior year, fixed it up junior summer, lived in it my senior year, sold it afterwards, made, I mean, self bend market isn't crazy, but made 25, 30 grand. Um, and I thought it was awesome. So when I got drafted into the NBA and I obviously had a contract and stuff like that, I wanted to put my money towards something in business and I wanted to do it with something that I knew, or at least had an understanding of that I could learn more about. And that was with my dad in, in, in business in, in real estate. And so, uh, he kind of dissolved his company back home and, and I started my own little development company that he helps me run on a day to day basis with my best friend, uh, Joe Stan that we grew up together. And, um, it started with a few house flips. That's all I had money for a uh, second round pick. The contract wasn't, uh, you know, Giannis status, if you will. So I had to obviously start low and, um, that's what my dad did. But what I slowly started to realize was like, that's what my dad did. He flipped houses because that's what, when he sold them, he made some money to provide for my family. We're in fortunate position where, you know, we have a day job, if you will, a basketball is obviously our income. Um, and so I want to try to start to build something in real estate that's for later on in life. So, you know, as opposed to flipping houses, you know, we look for multi family buildings or mixed use buildings or things that, you know, with my dad's expertise in building, you know, we can develop, we can create some value in, we can buy a shitty building and, and make it into a building that people want to be in. We're doing, we've done four in uh, Portland when I was out there, my second and third year. Um, we've done two starting this year in Milwaukee. I've done three back at Notre Dame, the two and the three at Nor Milwaukee and Notre Dame are under development now. So they're not done, but uh, I just started to see, the business behind it and how it works. And as I started to do more of it, I've had more NBA guys that wanted to get involved and that kind of helped me be an advocate for athletes and business and also kind of disprove that stereotype because the way it's set up the, like in real estate, it's advantageous to, you know, later on in life. And as athletes, if we have a short window to make money, but we can build something in that short window, we can create a real estate portfolio in that short window in 10, 15 years, it'll start to make money. Then it's kind of like an annuity. It's like the pension and the 401k and things like that. Just it happens a little quicker. And so, um, I've gotten a, a handful of guys involved and I've started to try to grow it to get more guys involved. And, uh, one of the biggest things that, you know, the, one of the biggest requirements I have for before athletes get involved is just that they're getting involved because they want to learn about the business. I think all professional athletes at some point in time, want a dream home, want a second home, want something whether they want to continue to invest in real estate or not is to their own accord, but they're going to be open to real estate. And you, there are so many guys that have gotten taken by general contractors and developers and people who are building their homes um, and shafted from a monetary standpoint and a building standpoint, because they don't have any idea of what it's like. So guys that invest, you know, they come by the job site, they learn the financial side, they learn how much something should cost, why it costs that, why we're building this type of building as opposed to that type and how, the money on the front end is actually going to turn into that much more money on the back end. And that's one of the things that I thoroughly enjoy. And it's, it's, it's not as complicated as I think some guys think. 
Um, it can be if you make it that way, but being able to kind of talk to them and be part of the you know fraternity. I mean, I think we know as athletes, you get approached by a businessman just because of history and all the bad ones out there. You're a little bit wary, you're a little on guard. If you can do business with guys within that fraternity who are coming from the same perspective as you, um, I'm that much more comfortable with it. Is this something that you see yourself doing for sure when you're done playing? Yeah, definitely. You know, I yeah. think in a, in a perfect world, um, I'd like to build, you know, two, three, four properties a year. Um, the way the one that's set up now is like when we rent the three units, the building itself will only yield probably one and a half, two grand a month. Um, so 20, 24 grand a year, which most athletes are like, what is that compared to what I'm making? But in 10, 15 years, when that mortgage falls off, that turns into eight grand a month. You do two, three, four of them each year that turns into real dollars. Uh, and what I would in a, in a perfect world love to do is build that real estate portfolio with other NBA guys, other professional athletes. And then as that portfolio continues to grow, work with the NBA, the players associations across different sports leagues to just talk with athletes, work with athletes to help them understand the model of making sure that they're using their finances to the best of their ability. And they're not spending all of their money and wasting it because we are in a fortunate position. We've hit the lottery. We might as well, odds are not great of hitting the lottery again. Right. Is it, is it, is it a common thing? Uh, I mean, you mentioned broke, which is, which is a great documentary. There've been a million, uh, articles and I think a few books just about uh, athletes, athletes and artists getting sort of to your use your words taken by like business managers and stuff like that. Is it a common thing with contractors and things like if someone's building a house, uh, where they're misrepresenting and overcharging and things like that? Absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to use names, but there's a, I have a teammate right now who's in a legal battle because he hired a general contractor, one who was recommended to him by a realtor that had worked closely with our team. Um, and the general contractor took his money and didn't pay any of the subcontractors. So right then and there, the guy took his money and ran. So he's out money. And now you get the subcontractors that are coming to my teammate because they need to get paid. They yeah. didn't have a contract with the GC. They have, you technically have a contract with the owner of the property. So not only are you out the money, the GC took, if you can't get it back during a legal battle, you actually are on the hook for the contracts with the subcontractors. So, and, and in general, like that's a drastic example, but in general, the reason general contracting and building and developing is so imperfect is it's like enough, a different language. Like it's like learning Spanish if you don't know Spanish. Right. So having my dad be able to talk to the subs that are doing it, he knows right away if what they're talking is real or if it's bullshit. Right. But it's also unique because the price for things is different in different areas. So like when you're buying something online, you're buying a shirt, uh, whatever, whatever shirt you're buying, it is one price. Whether I'm buying it in LA, sure, there's sales tax, but it, it's a price, right? Online. In general contracting, a two by four that I buy in Milwaukee to put up the studs for my building, it might cost three bucks a two by four. In Boston, it's going to cost seven. It's based off the market, just like in a house, like a yeah. 7,000 square foot house in Milwaukee is going to cost two and a half million bucks. A 7,000 square foot house in Boston is going to cost seven and a half million bucks. Like, and that difference allows contractors to take advantage of it. Right. And if you don't understand how to build a property or a building or a house, like you're already at a disadvantage and then they can just build in costs. So a GC on average, 15 to 20% is what they're taking of the total cost of the project. So my co project in Milwaukee, say it's going to cost a million bucks. They're going to get paid 200, 200 grand, 150. Now we do our own GCing, so we're not paying that, but that's what it would be. But then He's also the one in charge of ordering all of the materials and paying the subcontractors, paying their time for labor. And if he's telling you it's costing one thing, you have to take his word on it. He can show you a receipt, but if a two by four is three bucks, but he's ordering 700 of them, you're going to get a bulk order discount. If he's not giving you the bulk order discount, anything between that three bucks and what he actually got for a discount is now going into his pocket as well. I, Tommy, to your question, I have a, a very, I'm going to keep this story as short as possible. So <clears throat> Chelsea and I were getting ready to get married in 2010. The home that I had bought my rookie year in Orlando, somebody had rented out 
we were living in Winter Park. So when the renters moved out, they, you know, they had done some things to the place and we were going to move back in after our, our wedding. So we were like, let's get some work done. So we went to Home Depot and I, the, I knew nothing back then. I don't know what a general contractor is. I don't know anything. So we went to Home Depot. We picked out some paint samples and we said to the lady at the, at the Home Depot, we were like, do you know any painters? And she's like, I, we don't, we can't do that here at Home Depot, but here's a card of someone I know. So this guy turns out to be a general contractor, basically. So long story short, um, I had like given him money to go buy, uh, extend my fence in the backyard. And he sent me the receipt. The fence never came. I go back like six weeks later, I go to home Depot. Hey, here's this receipt. Where's the order number. And he's like, Oh yeah, sir. I, you know, I see from our records that you returned it five minutes after you bought it. <laughs> so he had pocketed the money. So, so I'm like, man, fuck this. So I go, I like, and he, this guy had done some things that were shady already. So I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I go back to my house. We were still not living in the house. I go back to my house and uh, like nothing had been done. He had like basically done this to the walls with paint. But I go back to my house and he, it was like four o'clock in the afternoon and he's in my theater room upstairs drinking Heineken. <laughs> like, no way. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> and he, I, and I hid a blanket up there, so he probably had slept up there at some point in time. Um, lesson learned on that one. My next door neighbor, had I known, my next door neighbor was a general contractor, and he ended up doing all the work for me at a very, very nice rate. Uh, didn't cost me a lot, but oh fuck, dude, Pat, it's, I, I do, I, I want to say it's, it's, uh, it is admirable, and I, like, I'm a little jealous of you because. You know, Tobias and I always talk, Tobias Harris and I always talk about this, like building an enterprise, building something that goes beyond basketball, building something that goes beyond just like money to give to your kids when you're done and when you're, you know, when you're retired, retired, or when you die, like building something that that is much bigger than that. And, you know, I didn't start having these uh, conversations and I didn't start having these thoughts till I had kids when I was like 30, 31 years old. And to to be so active and and already be doing this and already building something at at such a young age is is fucking awesome, man. It really is. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You'll have to come by the job site next time we play in Milwaukee. I will for sure. For yeah. sure. If, yeah. if we if I ever play again in Milwaukee, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. may be bubbled exactly. in Orlando every, next season. Every every game is it gonna be Orlando from now on. <laughs> yeah. For the next three years. Um so I just in reading a little bit about you, and obviously we we all know that that you were a, a stud in baseball, but I, I wanted to sort of go into the decision uh, of picking basketball over baseball, and and I, it's from my understanding, you know, you were growing up a better a better baseball player than you were a basketball player. Yeah, I mean, arguably up until three years ago, I was a better baseball player than I was basketball <laughs> player. And I've been in the league five years. So that kind of yeah. tells you where people thought me of, but, um, I played both all the time. I played football too, but baseball and basketball are kind of my two things. Um, I always had to work a little harder at basketball. Um, I always had to put a little more time in, um, and baseball came a little bit easier and I did everything in baseball. I played the field, shortstop center field. I could hit, I pitched obviously. And, uh, I enjoyed it a lot, but when it came down to it, so I had an opportunity out of high school, the New York Yankees offered me 2 million bucks and a second round draft pick because back then that was before the money was slotted. It was the last year where it could be negotiable, um, come out of high school to not go to college. Uh, and so I kind of looked, I had a conversation with my parents and, um, you know, I kind of just said, Hey, like my dream has always been to play college basketball when I was in my town. I went to a high school 25 minutes away. That was 1300 all boys. Nobody thought I was going to be able to play basketball there. They knew I was going to be able to play baseball there. I ended up playing basketball there, obviously being successful. And when I was playing basketball there, everyone was like, yeah, you're great at high school basketball. You'll never play college basketball, so on and so forth. Right. So I always had to put a lot of time, effort and energy into becoming the basketball player that I wanted to be, um, showing I was athletic enough when people obviously stereotype me that I wouldn't be. Uh, and then, winning plays, hard work, all the little things that come with it. Right. So, um, I just didn't want to give that up out of high school. Uh, you know, so, and I thought, you know, there's been a few guys, Amir Garrett, um, played basketball at St. John's university and he signed with the reds and he played basketball at St. John's, but in the summers played baseball in the reds minor leagues. I personally thought for my own development, 
it would be better to play both on the same campus. Um, the coaches were going to work together. I had a good relationship with both coaches. Actually, the baseball coach was a Boston college coach during my entire high school tenure. So I, he came to all my games. I got to know him really well. Um, and I thought it would just work better. And I figured for my development, if the baseball teams wanted me that badly out of high school, as long as I didn't suck in college, like it would be there again. Right. And then I told all the baseball teams that, so I got drafted out of high school, but it was like the 38th round. And it was because I told everyone, Hey, I want to go to college. I want to play baseball in college. Out of college, it became a little bit more of a decision because I had a real opportunity um, after my sophomore year. Now, you can't get drafted until your junior, but after my sophomore year, I pitched really well and I was projected to be a first round baseball pick. Um, and I actually sat down with a few of the professors at Notre Dame. And that's when I kind of started to think business with regards to my decision. Like, how are the two sports set up as far as business, uh, money making, things like that? And then I, the baseball agent I hired was, uh, Sam Samarja, Jeff Samarja's brother who represented Jeff, who was a two sport guy and Russell Wilson, who was a two sport guy. So I kind of had a few conversations with them about it as well. And what I came to the conclusion of was, Hey, baseball, you get a signing bonus at the beginning. Then if you're on a fast track, you work your way through the minor leagues for three years, but most guys, it takes three to five years. You're making 1100 bucks a month in the minor leagues only for the time you're playing. Um, and if in the worst case scenario, I didn't pan out to be as good, which hopefully I would have, but if I didn't pan out to be as good as they wanted me to be, what was I going to do after five years? Try to go back to basketball at the age of 27. Like, so when I looked at the nature of the two sports, I thought, I don't want to give up on basketball before I see it through. So I went back to school with my senior year, which I told everyone I dropped to a fourth round draft pick when I told everyone, Hey, I'm going to go back for my senior year and play basketball. I can graduate and I want to, you know, see the basketball stuff through. And none of the baseball teams thought I had a chance to be in the NBA. All of them actually said it to my face. So they were like, sure, no problem. So the Orioles drafted me, paid me for that summer, paid me my sign bonus, played pro for their minor league system for a summer. And then after, after the college, uh, you know, I got drafted in basketball, but the decision was, Hey, if I didn't pan out in basketball, especially the second round pick, I know in two to three years as a pitcher being drafted in baseball, I'm, the training you need for basketball, I'm far more athletic than the majority of baseball guys would be my guess. Uh, and I had a strong arm and in that one summer playing pro baseball, I was able to see how far I came from the beginning to the end. And the team really wanted me to come back because of that. But I figured if I didn't make it in basketball, I could go back to baseball. Whereas if I didn't make it in baseball, I could go back to basketball while also getting paid more in basketball at the beginning than I would have in baseball. And so I've been giving basketball a chance ever since. Yeah. You're five. You're five in the NBA. It seems like you made the right decision. However, if, if, if the NBA ended and you, and somebody said to you, like you, you got a chance to, to, you know, try it for a big league team or whatever, how much time training would you need a month, three months to get back to it? So probably three yeah. years ago, it probably would have been a month. I bet now yeah, it's probably a say, little more time. I was going to say a few years ago, I'd give you a different answer. Last year, I probably would have given you a different answer. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, enough people have had laughs about it. I threw out a first pitch last year during the playoffs for the Milwaukee Brewers, and I almost killed the lady behind the plate. Was nowhere close to the plate. I <laughs> dropped. Now it wasn't fifty cent where I put it into the ground. Like it had some heat on it. It just overflew everybody. Uh, but honestly, I would say the biggest thing would be my arm, like athletically and explosiveness and all that sort of stuff. I'd already be there, but getting your arm in shape to throw the flexibility it needs the work on the little muscles, the tendons. It's not like the bench and the dumbbells, all that. Like, I think it would still, I think it would honestly take me like eight months. Wow. I think, and, and when I say eight, I don't mean eight months of throwing to get back. I mean, like I'd have to do some stuff for two months to get my arm flexible again. I'd have to throw and get some strength back in those throwing muscles for another two or three months. I'd take a month off. And then after like two or three months from there, I'd be, I'd be good to go. Did, did you ever have a period uh, where you were really second guessing yourself? Uh, I wouldn't say I had a period where I was second guessing myself, but I will say like first two years in Portland, I didn't play much. I played a little in my second year when a few guys got hurt, but it wasn't until my third year where I played. So for those first two years, I mean, I was putting, I had to do some things basketball too. Like I was a stretch four in college. So I had to get my body in the right shape. I had to become a, you know, NBA two guard, like JJ knows. So 
Um, I had to do some things, so I was working on that, but there was definitely a few times where I was like, yeah, you know, if I was playing baseball right now, I'd be almost in the majors. I'd probably be having a lot of success. I'd be the guy like, yeah. that's what it was. That was the difference between baseball and basketball for me. Like as a prospect in baseball, I was a lottery pick talent potential, right? As a prospect in basketball, I was a second round guy that was just trying to be a role player. So there were a few times in those first two years, there may have been a time in the, in between the first and the second year that, you know, we had some time off. I went down to extended spring training and, you know, incognito you know, just threw, threw, threw the ball around a little bit and may have gotten in a little bit of trouble for it. But, uh, I was just on vacation. Everyone takes a vacation after the NBA season. And my vacation just happened to be in the same place where extended spring training was. But, uh, you know, it was other than those two times when I started to play my third year. And then, you know, since I've been with the bucks, um, you know, I haven't really thought twice. Take the baseball out of the equation. How, how, uh, how difficult was it? Cause I, I mean, I experienced the same thing my first two years, but how difficult was those first two years and just like not, not even being in the rotation really and, and having to mentally, you know, grind through that. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, like, look, anybody that gets to the NBA, they were the guy in high school, growing up college, yeah. like you, like you, you, you were the guy. So you're in a different, a much different position. I think, it took a lot of, you know, physical commitment for me to, you know, get my body where it needed to be, get my athleticism where it needed to be, even though I think I was half decently athletic beforehand, uh, getting fine tuning, you know, shooting, dribbling, like little things like that, that you'll have to translate on a more consistent basis. But the biggest thing I think was the mental focus on like where I think guys struggle with is like the things that aren't basketball related, being a good teammate, Like when you're in a situation where you want to play and you're watching a game and you think you can help, but you're not getting called on, like, are you still going to stand up and wave that towel when your team's coming back? Are you going to be that energetic guy on the bench? Are you going to bring some value to the team even when you're not playing? Um, Which is mentally hard to do. Like you gotta, you gotta wrap your mind around and be like, Hey, look, I'm sacrificing here because it's going to pay off in the long run. And sometimes it's hard to see that belief because you know, your NBA career is not going to last long. If all you are is a cheerleader on the bench for your whole career, no one's getting paid for that. Right. But there is a period of time, at least from what I experienced in my first two years where I had to put in the work behind the closed doors when no one was watching and it wasn't in games. And when it was games, I had to, I had to be up. I had to be into the game. I had to know everything that was going on and I had to bring some value from a cheering standpoint in order to, be get that reputation of a good teammate and to make sure that when I did get my opportunity, I was ready to perform. How much of that specifically in Portland was driven by your best player being such a good teammate and such a good leader? I mean, I I really, from the outside, Damian Lillard is the real deal to me. Everything I've heard about him, anybody's ever, anything, anybody, anything, anybody's ever said to me about him, He's just the real deal. And, and, and I wonder, I, I really believe like that permeates that fo- that's fostered. That culture is fostered by the leader. hundred percent. I mean, the, the comparison I make with Dame and Giannis, the, the comp, the best compliment I think I can give to somebody is both of them are better people than they are basketball players. And we all see how good of basketball players they are. Right. And from a leadership standpoint, you know, they're both great, but Dame, Dame was, Dame was awesome. You know, I think, and, and the leadership was, excuse me, done so well that he had relationships with everybody on the team, which in a way also created everybody on the team, helping each other, even without trying. So like my first two years in the league, like Dame helped keep my confidence up. He put in extra work in the gym. He allowed me to do the work with him. Um, and we always had a a great relationship and and still do to this day, but he also was such a great leader. Guys like Alan Crabb, guys like CJ McCollum, guys like, you know, all of them that came through there. Um, they were in the same spot I was at one point in time. They weren't playing as much in their first year, year and a half, maybe two years. And then when they get their opportunity because of the work they put in with Dame, with the assistant coaches, because that culture Dame kind of has built within the Blazers locker room. I learned from them just as much as I learned from Dame because I was in their position and, you know, 
they had gone through it a year, two years, three years before. So working with them and, you know, being able to see what they learned from Dame and how they did it and how they went through it really helped me get through it and understand that, Hey, you know, that stuff that you put in, in that practice facility in Tualatin, Oregon is going to pay off at the motor center at some point in time. What is, what is, uh, what is Giannis's leadership style? Cause I don't think people really, at least in the articles I read, like that, that doesn't get mentioned a lot. So, you know, I think, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, but like, um, you know, Giannis is a guy, I think his leadership, he's becoming from what I've seen over the last two years, I've been here two years. He's getting to a point now where his voice is becoming heard often when I, but what he's always done really well is lead by example. And like my first, I mean, the best story I can tell is, you know, when I first got to Milwaukee, being a second round guy and having to put in that extra time. Like when I first got to Milwaukee, we, we would play pickup, you know, for that month of September and before training camp. Right. And you play pickup in the morning, 11 to one o'clock, and then you're done. You come back the next day and you do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, I was the type of guy, I came back to the gym every night, like came back to the gym, got up extra shots. Like I wanted to make sure I was ready to, to have an impact on this team. The second night I came back, Giannis was there and Giannis was like, what are you doing here? And I was kind of like, what are you doing here? Like, and we had that moment where he was like, I come back all the time, but like, I've never had anybody that comes back with me, like, or has also been here. And, you know, I said to him, like, look, this is what I have to do to succeed in this league. Like, these are the time, the energy, the hours I have to put in, especially as a young guy in, uh, on the team. And he was there every night. He was like, I'm going to come back every night with you. Like, we're going to shoot. We're going to shoot. And like, he understood what he had to work on. So we shot together and those competitions and things like that. But like, what I'm trying to say is, he works as if he's a second round role player, but his talent is that of a MVP championship caliber teammate. So yeah. I think that has, is what's really started to build the culture of the Milwaukee bucks as we've gotten better is he is a guy that puts in extra time in the gym. You can see it just from the transformation of his body over his years in the league. And now he's put putting extra time in the gym when it comes to his skill set. And when the best player on your team, especially on a championship team is doing that, everybody else kind of falls in that same line. And now he's becoming vocal. And, and when I say that, I mean, he has relationships and friendships and he has conversations in the locker room with every guy on the team and everybody wants to play for him. And same with like coach, Bud. I think that culture that is being built in Milwaukee from the top down is guys are playing for each other, which, I mean, I'm sure you've seen more than myself, JJ being in the league longer. Like that's a college type culture because of where yeah. you are in your age and the friends that you're building in the NBA, the business can get the way of it sometimes. And that culture kind of gets lost in my opinion. For sure. I mean, and you brought it up about the age of players, where you are in your life. Yeah. Guys have families. Guys don't have families. Guys want to be in the streets. Guys don't want to be in the streets. Guys want to play video games. Guys want to read books. Everybody's, yeah. there's a lot of different. So like, I've always found like on some, some teams there's like clicks. I don't want to call them clicks. So that's negative, but there's like groups of three or four and groups of three or four. And then if you can find that commonality, whether it's on the court or in the locker room, you know, those teams are, are, are great. And they, they end up playing for each other but sometimes it can be a little difficult at times to, to find those commonalities. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think like one thing that the, you know, the bucks and, and, you know, Giannis has been a big part of it, like have done is there is a culture build, whether it be, you know, we call them break breads, but like team dinners where it's not mandatory. Like if we stay over in city, it's not mandatory. So the second you make something mandatory guys there, cause they have to be right. Yeah. But when it's not mandatory, but guys are still going because now people have family in different cities, not everyone's going, but guys are still going because they want to hang around their teammates. They want to hang around their coaches. They want to eat a good meal. Guys have good wine. Like you're starting to build relationships that go beyond the basketball court. And I think in my personal opinion, that's when the best basketball is played because you're putting your time, energy, effort, blood, sweat, tears is a cliche on the line for the person next to you, not just for your own ambitions. And I think that's when the best of teams come out. 
All right, we're gonna get to a few uh just like quick hitters, like speed round questions. Okay. Got it. Um got it. and you can just you just gotta answer them honestly. Okay. Got so it. if if you went to a baseball game right now and you were walking on the second deck uh looking for a hot dog stand and there was one of those uh radar guns where you throw into a little pitching mat, how fast would you throw? No warm ups. I I give you two pitches. Eighty nine. Eighty nine. Pretty good. I threw I, I threw the <laughs> first pitch in Portland my third year at the Hillsborough Hops game, and I hit ninety one. Holy! And that That's one didn't. Bad. That one didn't almost hit an old lady. Nope, that was in the strike zone. Although the catcher didn't catch it because I told him it was coming in hot, and he was like, "Yeah, okay." And it came in hot. <laughs> if, if you're if you're stuck on a desert island, you get one movie. What is it? Mm. One. Uh, it can be a rom com if you want. Yeah, just go with it. Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. Ooh, love Jen. God. I like it. Uh, <laughs> weirder Lopez brother. Ooh, uh, Robin. Interesting. That was unexpected. That was unexpected. Favorite fa- <laughs> favorite airline snack. On the airline specifically or in the airport? Uh, I think we could do airport. Airport counts. Um, uh, what are they called? Uh, Dots pretzel sticks. Um, they're fuck. Good. I'm, they're great. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> Never even heard of that. I think we're taking your word for it, but I like <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> do the Milwaukee Bucks ever practice? Yes. I've got intel that says otherwise. <laughs> we practice. Now, I'll say... What is a practice? Okay, what does a practice look like? <laughs> <laughs> you said there was a quick hitter. How much in-depth do you want me to go? I want to know because I. Here, this is this, not what my way. intel is telling there was, me. There was, one, there was one practice where we played wiffle ball. Okay. So you're at the gym on a consistent basis, but are you going like an hour live, five on five? No. How often does that happen during the season? Depends on breaks, but I would say once a week. It's always interesting to me that the best teams don't really practice. Yeah. And the worst teams <laughs> think that all you have to do is practice to get better. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a different philosophy in today's, today's NBA. Um, really you, a stranded traveler stuck in Milwaukee for 24 hours. Uh, what's the single thing they need to eat? Oh, uh, I would say I would say San Giorgio's pizza. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't Could say cheese. cheese, beer, but I was going to say not, cheese curds. I, yeah. yeah. I, I'm glad you didn't say that. I'm glad you yeah. didn't say that. Uh, all right, Pat, we appreciate your time. Thanks for being an awesome guest. And, this is uh, great, man. I'll, I'll look forward to to seeing you inside the bubble in a month. Yeah, yeah, Can't it should wait. be fun. Should be fun. We can share share some more contractor stories. Hopefully you don't have any more of those. <laughs> <laughs>